Hey, so today on the hype hour, okay, man, we need a drum roll for for this. This is definitely, definitely, <laughs> definitely special. Special to me because, you know, just thinking about, you know, growing up uh, in the sneaker culture and uh, just really uh, looking at different different shoes, different aesthetics and, and what makes that. We have the jack of all trades, uh, jack, uh, Jock Slade on here. And uh, I usually call him Cousteau, but how's it going, man? It's going, it's going well. And thank you, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Jack of all trades, I'll take that. Uh, I don't feel like that all the time, but I, I appreciate the sentiment for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, when you look at your Instagram, I mean, I, I like how it's very, it's very humble. You know what I mean? It's, it's I make music. I mean, I make mo um, videos. You know, host. You know, shows and and do stuff or whatnot. But I mean, honestly, um, you know studying you out and, 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 and learning about your, your uh, development is, has been really exciting and, and, and really cool. You know, um, you know, for some of the people that don't know who, uh, Jacques is, he's, uh, just a virtuoso when it comes to, uh, you know, the understanding of shoes and, and other things as well. I don't want to box you in. I think that's the reason why you have, <laughs> you know, such a, a vague, uh, Instagram, uh, bio. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I didn't want. I try to. I try not to box myself in. I, 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 I acknowledge and I am aware that sneakers is like the conversation piece around me, um, and I'm just trying my best to um, honestly keep that as a base, but also expand beyond that and show people that I have uh, talent in other areas um, as, as much as possible. Yeah, no, I hear that. And, you know, as far as like your, your name goes, I mean, some people know you as Cousteau. Is that, you know, like, uh, you know, the we know the French naval uh, officer uh, Jacques Cousteau. Is, <laughs> does that does it come from that? Is that der a derivative of that or? Uh, yeah. So that's when I was in when I was in high school, I wanted to be uh, a rapper and um, my friends just called me Jacques Cousteau just because of, of Jacques Cousteau, the, uh, the French guy. And so like the name just kind of stuck. And so like my, my in internet name became Cousteau. Um, but now, now it's kind of like a mix. I go, I just go by Jacques for the most part. Um, but people still call me Cousteau. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so can you take us back, you know, take us way back, take us, take us back to, you know, when you was, uh, when you were a rapper, uh, even maybe far further beyond that, how did you get into, uh, you know, sneakers and, you know, just the culture in general? Well, sneakers came uh, as a result of basketball. So I love basketball. Like I love, love, love basketball. Like basketball was like the first thing that like caught my attention. And it was like, this is what I want to do. Um, so as, as a result of playing basketball, you see all the people with cool shoes. Like that's just part of like the world of basketball is like having like the best basketball shoe to play in. And in my neighborhood, all the guys that I looked looked up to that played basketball, they always had like these cool shoes on. And so as an extension, me wanting to me one wanting to play basketball, play basketball like them, because, you know, this is when I was young, like five, six years old. And, you know, these guys are dunking and slapping the backboard and making long threes and all these things. And like that was just like super fascinating to me. So I wanted to do everything that they did, the clothes they wore, the shoes they wore, all of those sorts of things. Um, and so that's kind of how the love for sneakers came out of a out of a love for basketball. OK, yeah. And, and you talked a little bit about like, um, you know, your extent as a rapper. Right. I mean, let's yeah, go yeah. into that a little bit, because I think that, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, sneaker culture, basketball, all these things, I think they're all intertwined. You know what I mean? Like, especially growing yeah. up, you know, watching, you know, people like, you know, Michael Jordan, of course, like changed the whole idea of what a sneaker was. People were rocking sneakers um, as a imprint of who they were and, and like kind of like their identity. And I think Michael really took it to another level, inviting like Spike Lee's and, you know, that type of, you know, take it, take yeah. us back during that time. You know what I mean? And like what really, you know, what was it about during that time as far as just, you know, the um, as, as in comparison to today, but really I want to go into your childhood and kind of like discover a little bit more of like who Cousteau is, you know? Um, it's, it's interesting. So I think, um, for me, I always wanted to be an entertainer in some form or a way. Uh, I think basketball was obviously the sport, but like I always wanted to entertain. 
Um, so like I was like my mom will tell you like I was always in the back seat singing to the radio and kind of performing on my own in the back seat of the car. Um, and so like I, th I think that's where like the music and, and the hip hop and the rap sort of thing kind of came about just because that was always kind of like a part of me. Um, and I, I think that's what helped inform who I am now and even how I present content now, just because I always try to do it in a way that that's for lack of a better term, entertaining. Mm, um, and yeah. I pull, I pull on a lot of that background when I'm creating now these days, like, you know, uh, the, the, the time that I spent on stage rapping or being in the studio rapping and writing and trying to craft a song and thinking about the song structure and all those things. I think all, all of that kind of goes into the content that I make today. Um, uh, cause I think it just, it just makes me a better presenter, host, entertainer all around. Yeah. No, I hear that. What was like the first collab that you were aware of when you were younger that really, uh, kind of, uh, got your attention as far as sneakers we see all these different collabs these days like with you know even levi wow. i mean <laughs> yeah yeah um Le back Levi's then and yeah. gosh back then i think as a kid guy I don't, I don't even remember honestly i just remember like just seeing like jordans like jordans was like the coolest thing back then uh shelto adidas were super cool back then um case swiss were cool back then like case swiss know, I grew up in a, yeah i grew up in a neighborhood <laughs> with like there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of gangs gangs in my neighborhood, and like all of them wore K Swiss. Like they wore K Swiss, and then like the the Hispanic gangs wore Cortez. Mm. And so like you know back then they were kind of like the cool people in the neighborhood. So like I was like, oh, they wore K Swiss. I got to get a pair of K Swiss because like that's the cool thing to wear. Yeah, no, I hear that. I remember. I mean, K Swiss. I mean, they're. Just, I mean, are they still in business or? Yeah, yeah, no, they are. They are. Okay, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we see like a lot of, you know, uh, like Fila coming back out with, you know, more stuff. And, you know, yeah. even I think LA Gear has decided to, you know, like really come out the woodwork. Skechers, I mean, Skechers wasn't really something that, you know, was like huge back then. I mean, it was huge, but it wasn't huge, like in the sense of like, you know, I guess the sneaker culture was kind of like, oh, yeah. like, yeah, those are comfortable, but they ain't something we, we trying to wear. But going right. back, <laughs> going back to your childhood, with the you know the k-swiss and cortez like you know uh what area did you grow up in so i grew up in uh what's called the valley uh it's right outside of los angeles technically it's, it's um like southern california so it's the valley it's a city called pacoima um okay yeah. like the far end of the valley uh for those that that know about the valley it's like it's like the to be fair, the, like the, the ghetto part of the valley. To, yeah, <laughs> to be fair. yeah. In, I mean, <laughs> to, to keep it a hundred. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely developed over the years a little bit more. But yeah, I know. For I know. Sure. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, different. Yeah, gangs in that area, like Piru and and all that stuff or yeah. whatnot. So, because I'm I'm a part of the valley as well. But um, yeah, you know, like uh, it's interesting. Like, um, what do you feel like as far as you know, just uh, identity and people linking it to brands? Like, why do you think that there's such a um an infatuation with that? Um, especially lately, where we see different collabs with like Travis Scott and a few other you know Kanye's and things like that. Why do you feel? I mean, or do you feel that, you know, there's like a, a an infatuation with uh, just attaching your name to a brand? No, I don't think there's an infatuation. I just think it's the natural growth of the of the community. Like, you know, for for a long time, like hip hop didn't it, there was a stigma if you kind of attached yourself to a brand or if you if you um like worked with some with corporate or something like that. Um, but now I think that stigma is changing and it's it's more accepted because I mean, other genres of music, they do it. Actors, actresses, they do it. Celebrities, they all do it. Um, but for some reason, hip hop, there was like this stigma to it. And um, I think that is slowly changing. Actually, I would say it's slowly changing. It's definitely changed. Travis Scott is doing stuff with McDonald's. Like, <laughs> that's a fantastic <laughs> opportunity for him. Totally. Like, that's like in my mind. Like in my mind, it's like, oh, that's awesome. Like, did you try that burger? The by the way, I, I did not try the burger. <laughs> uh, but but it shows the it shows the growth. It shows where we are. Shows where hip hop is in 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 the in the in the world in the sense of pop culture. We know that hip hop moves culture. We know that people want whatever is in hip hop, 
and now you're seeing these big corporations really take on like, yo, like this, this is where it's at. This is the community we need to reach. Um, and it, and it puts the power in the hands of those in that community. Yeah. What do you, what do you feel like was the fear for corporate America? Like at least like 15 years ago? Well, I, I think it was a mix. I think it was a fear of corporate America and the concept of keeping it real in the hip hop community. Mm. Um, you know that I, I think there there was always that kind of that stigma of being of being part of being or going corporate or selling out where like that is not a thing anymore. Like I mean, uh, I forgot there was a song. I think it was EPMD that that uh, made a song about selling out. Or, or, I can't remember who was. Yeah. I don't remember who it was. Mm-hmm. So, no, no. Yeah, yeah, I think that that concept isn't there anymore. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I guess a thought that comes by my mind is, you know, there there used to be a real big distinction between like the underground and the mainstream. Right. Especially in street culture where it was like, oh, you mess with such and such. I don't mess with you. You know what I mean? And like on on a big level, it's like, wow, like you either you're most deaf, you're, you know, uh, let's even go further back. But like, you know, you're, you know, KRS-One, you're these type of, you know, rappers or you're more like LL Cool J, you know, like straight down the middle type of uh, vibe, even though, you know, LL Cool J had some, you know, street cred, but really, realistically, now you see these cultures kind of merging together where, you know, there's a unity. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think, I mean, I think it's it's just showing the natural growth of the genre and the, the natural growth of the community. I mean, I would almost blame LL and Ice T for making <laughs> hip hop and rap palpable. Between LL, Ice T, and Will Will Smith, like they made hip hop palpable for a larger audience. Yeah. You know, people pe- people love Law and Order, and they see Ice T on, on <laughs> Law and Order. They you know they love CSI, and they see LL on CSI or whatever the name of the show is that he's on. Yeah. And then Will obviously with Fresh Prince and and turning into like a blockbuster actor. Uh, you know, like they made hip hop palpable for a larger audience, and now you see bigger you know you see that more it's more and more common now that these actors are getting into i mean these rappers are getting into acting and becoming a bigger part of that scene um which is you know where most of america you know the middle middle of america gets their information yeah yeah i you know i see it um also as like a double-edged sword in some sense right and like because i come from more of like the underground scene and you know uh but double-edged meaning like Obviously, you know, underground is like more exclusive. It's like, yo, do you got those, you know, you know, such and such or whatever you can, you kind of have this cool mystique behind everything. And when the veil is, you know, taken off, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, everybody gets to see this. So how exclusive is it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know, I know what you mean. And that, I guess that that is like the other side of it. There's, there's always going to be a community that wants to be like, uh, want it to be that that are like, take a more of a purist stance, I would say, to it. Um, and then there's going to be those that want it to go far and wide and want everyone to experience the joy of what that community is about. So you have you're going to have that that um, that battle between those two. But I think it, it helps. You know, you need the purists to keep it honest, but you also need the people that want to help it grow and expand it. Yeah, totally. You know, uh, fast forwarding a little bit to, uh, you know, this interview uh, that you did um, at Jordan's house, Um, (laughs) you you know, like how like how crazy was that? Like getting into, you know, like obviously that is, you know, a pivotal person and a pivotal really company, you know, and what they did with Phil Knight and and Michael Jordan and and Tinker Hatfield and, you know, being a part of uh, more of a bigger conversation at that point. What was your thoughts walking into the house and kind of, you know, dissecting everything? Um, I mean, I I think anything, it was just just blown away. It was super it was almost surreal. It was like, I can't believe I'm here, you know, as a, as a basketball fan, like out, even outside of the shoes, like forget the shoes, let's not even talk about the shoes, <laughs> Put the shoes on like, the table just, somewhere. Yeah. But to say it on the table, it's just basketball. Like 
he was like the walking, living, breathing example of what basketball was for a lot of people at that point, you know, when he was at his heyday. Like you couldn't go anywhere without hearing his name or you couldn't go to any basketball court without seeing somebody with their long shorts on or with their armband on or something. You know what I mean? Like he was everything when it came to basketball and to be able to walk into this gate, it's almost like like you're getting again, it's like that kind of getting a peek behind the curtain. Not And like I didn't even see him like he wasn't even there. It was just his house. But the fact that I was at those gates with that giant 23 there. It Jeez. was like, wow, like this is like this is amazing. And like that that was probably of everything that I saw, I think the biggest moment was being there at that gate and seeing that gate open with the 23 and like being able to walk past that gate. Cause you know, it's one of those things like even though I'm from LA, you know, you'll see like a celebrity house and you'll walk past their house and you'll see like, oh, that's that's where Blank be Blank live or that's where who, yeah. who lives and blah, blah, blah. But you never go beyond the gate. Ooh. And like this was this was like the opportunity to go beyond the gate. So you see the 23 is like, oh, that's where MJ leaves. Oh, cool. But then it's like, oh, but you get to go in past the gates of where yeah. MJ lives. And so like, I don't think anything, nothing could really hold up to the moment of walking past the gate. So whatever I saw inside was going to be like, oh, okay, this is cool. This is great. It's a regular house at the end of the day. Yeah. But that that <laughs> mystique that you have of what's behind the gate is, I think, uh, being able to have access, I think that's what is the most fascinating. Wow. I mean, it, it kind of, to me, the depiction really, I think of like the Palace of Versailles, right? When you get past those gold gates, uh, you know, and it's just like, whoa, like what is in here? Do you feel like that supernatural feeling? Like when you're, you're like, okay, I'm in the presence of greatness. Like he was here, you know, and kind of like, give us a little bit of a synopsis on like what you saw there that really, I mean, what, what we didn't see on camera, what was something that like really hit you that was like, whoa, this guy really, you know, um, is, is different. Um, I don't think, I don't think it was more of that, that this guy is really anything different um, because, because again, because once you get past the mystique of, of having access, um, you, that's when like the facade starts to fall apart. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's like, there's all <laughs> of these like amazing people in the world, but the reality is they're people just like you and I. True. They they put their pants on one leg at a time. They tie their shoes. They they sleep. They eat. Like they do everything the same way that we do. Um, they they just have different experiences. So, but up and up until you you meet them, there's this mystique or this aura around them that you're like, oh man, like they're su this su person is super cool. I wish I could be that person. So for me, I, again, it was like once I got past that gate, that's when kind of the facade started falling apart. Like, oh, oh, he has a nice lawn, but yeah, he has a garden. Like, you got to keep his lawn up. He has a he has <laughs> yeah. a putting green. I, yeah, because he's got to work on his game, so he's got a putting green. Oh, he's, yeah, it's a it's a house. Like, it's a nice house. Oh, this is cool. It's a cool, nice house. Cool. He has a gym. All right. Cool. He has his kids' names. All right. Yeah, because he loves his kids. He's like, he's a dad. Like, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? All the all the reality parts start to kind of come together. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it I, I think, you know, over overall, the the experience is obviously great, and it's something that I can say that I was able to do. Um, but I don't I don't think there was anything out of the out of the ordinary that you wouldn't expect someone else to have in their house. Like he have obviously some bull stuff that, you know, every other re regular person wouldn't have. But for the most part, he just, he has a, a house like anybody else. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. Wow. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, and I think you bring up a great notion that like, you know, even prior to, you know, where we're at now as a, as a community and, you know, as a country in general, uh, we've always been able to, you know, like create and, and do really great, uh, things. Um, overall, I think that back in the day, there was much of a structure, right? There was the elitist culture is what I call it. Ma yeah. Mainly like, okay, well, you know, that's them doing their thing. And there was a glorification of like, you know, and, and honestly, a a conditioning of like this is an elite person you need to respect them you need to glorify them you mm -hmm. need to you know like 
bow to their like literally like all those things and kind of the structure that even went into those becoming that or whatnot you know you see that in music where you know be, prior to even releasing a, an album you had so many um so many uh, steps to get to uh being you know even put on tour or your album even yeah. coming out or you could get shelf these days we see you know young cats just putting out you know records on um you know, on SoundCloud, on Spotify themselves, you know what yep. I mean? And something that to me is like, wow, like, as you said, like, you know, taking down that veil and like really seeing what's behind, you know, I think kids these days are not afraid. Why do you think that is? Why do you? Well, I, I think it, it, the, the power of every, everything has been democratized. Uh, things are, are starting to become available to everyone now. You know what I mean? That's like, I, I like I remember the first time I got an inbox and recording in Pro Tools. I felt <laughs> like, oh, like now I have I have the power to create my own kind of destiny now. You know what I mean? Like I don't there's no the the gatekeepers are gone. And I, I think with what we're able to do now and the where technology has gone, the gatekeepers are slowly, slowly but surely falling down. And I don't I don't need to go through certain people in order for me to be where I am or for, in order for me to make it. So I think, I think that's, that's why you see such a change is like the gatekeep. They're no longer gatekeepers. The, the world is the judge now, not just one individual. Yeah. Do you think that the gatekeepers have to do with, uh, psychologically as well as like physically, or do you, I mean, as you refer to these gatekeepers, um, I think there, I think there's both. I think there's def definitely some physically, but there's also like si the psychological barriers that we place on ourselves. Um, but hopefully seeing other people do it on their own helps break down some of those psychological walls and lets us know that we can do it too. You know, as, as more and more people are able to kind of manifest their own destiny and be able to do things more on their own, you see the, um, you see other people being inspired by that. And I think that's, I think that's part of it. Yeah. Okay. And, and going to like where we are today, right. Where, you know, obviously COVID has happened and we're, you know, in a very historical time. Um, but also thinking about, um, how brands in a sense, um, have like we've kind of mentioned, um, have accepted, uh, the culture of hip hop, right. And, you know, obviously hip hop, uh, deriving from the origin of, you know, just, uh, you know, being African American or being black, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. what do you feel like in this time, you know, you've noticed, have you noticed anything like, as far as like, uh, kind of a, a switch in your industry, as far as, um, the way that, um, you know, African Americans and, and blacks alike are being viewed, uh, these days in comparison to maybe even, you know, two years ago or three years ago you know um I, I think that a lot of companies are starting um i shouldn't even say company i was to say people because it really starts with the people the, the people are are the company and i think people are starting to realize that there's a deeper story um in the african-american experience and um even though they may have heard about it or seen it on tv i think now they're really seeing it from a more personal stance of their own personal friends um, that are really active and that are experiencing these things. I think a lot of time there was a disconnect. A lot of people felt that there were these things happening, but, oh, it's not happening to my black friend. It's happening mm. over there or it's happening on the news. And I think now with the, the activity and the way things went, a lot of people are seeing that their black friend is still experiencing those things, but they just didn't tell them about it. And now they're being more open and more empathetic to the plight of the African American here in the, in, in the, uh, in the United States and seeing that the experience is not the same as theirs. And through that finding ways to incite change. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I love like what um, some of these uh, athletes are doing. I mean, even just wearing uh, a mask, right? Like the the idea of like being silenced kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's interesting yeah. that, you know, the pairing of uh, a mask and, you know, this time of you know, COVID, but also the awareness, I would say, of, you know, what is actually going on in, you know, the African American community um, and the black community just in general, you know what I mean? And so watching, yeah. you know, tennis matches or watching, you know, people, you know, always using like 
clothes and 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 uh you know even shoes as a form of expression you know yeah yeah you see you see that a lot now using using their voice and using their platform to to incite change it's it's important and it affects all of us so it's important that they do that totally well who do you think you know as far as brands like who do you think is making the most noise um when it comes to uh you know shedding the awareness um, I think all of the brands right now are just kind of are really doing a lot of self evaluation mm. um, and really looking at their own policies and procedures and their own corporate culture and seeing what the impacts of this conversation has on their own on their own core on their own, uh, on their own corporate system and then changing internally and then you'll start seeing stuff happen externally. Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't. I don't think there is any one brand in particular that's doing something extra special, but I do think it's been a bit of, um, I, I think a bell has went off in the brains of a lot of these companies and, and they know that they have to change based on everything that's happening around. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, um, one thing that really hit me, I was driving down downtown the other day. I mean, and when I say the other day, it was probably like a year ago, but, um, <laughs> it was a huge, like, uh, not even mural, but it was a huge, I don't know how big this thing was, but it was of Colin Kaepernick and it was like a Nike, uh, you know, poster. And, you know, yeah. it was Colin Kaepernick with his Afro, you know, and like, it's interesting because three years ago when Colin was, or even four years ago, when he was mentioning all this stuff or taking a knee and all this stuff, everybody kind of, you know, bypassed him like hey man like bro yeah. you know there was people even in the black community shunning him like hey bro like you you know you're half black you're half white man you don't really you're not in this conversation but there was also you know and and i've seen it you know and but to me driving down you know uh downtown and just seeing that big poster you know like i said of na all natural like his hair is out you know and it's just kind of like be the change that you want to see you know yeah. and it even gives me chills now because when i saw that i was like man you know, like um, when I look at like different brands, I'm not sure internally, you know, how Nike works with, you know, their collabs or whatever, and nor do I care. But it's really the fact that they use their platform um, that yeah. in that instance to like, you know, really uh, shed light on something that everybody was going left on. You know what I mean? And so yeah. Yeah. Um, and the same thing, like they took a chance with Michael Jordan, you know what I mean? Just watching the last dance or whatever and just being like, wow, like that was truly uh, a pivot move for, you know, Nike, you know what I mean? In the sense yeah. of like, yeah, you know, people can have their ideas where it's like, well, you know, like Michael's the best basketball player in the world. But realistically, I mean, I watched a few different documentaries, even from Tinker Hatfield's uh, vantage point, And it was like, you know, they, you know, Michael wasn't going to uh, be a part of Nike, you know, and there was a lot of confrontation and tension in that. But just to see how um, Nike has, you know, opened the doors, even if kind I mean, like for Kanye, yeah, like I, I understand like business probably wasn't the, what you expected, but they definitely opened the door and the Red Octobers and, you know, some of these other, you know, classic, yeah. you know, uh, Nike collabs or whatever are still Nike collabs. You know what I mean? So, yeah. What yeah, are your thoughts? No, it, it, no, it's really it's it, it's inspirational and, and, it, and it, it's it's you almost feel like it's about time that you see companies get active you know for a long time companies tried to stay out of these conversations and not participate in these conversations not knowing how that impacted the the people that they work with um or that work for them and now i think they're seeing that the lack of having a voice or the lack of having an angle um is 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 not is not the way to go anymore you need to be active you need to be speaking especially when you want to be a part of the community um and so you that's why you see changes like that happening with those companies a hundred percent and another thing that we see a lot um you know with you these days um and just in general is you know these unboxings of these these shoes you know what i mean um yeah. and i keep on bringing up shoes and you know like and and other things but really I find it really cool because you get to see things from a different angle than the average uh, person, right? You you probably have right. seen some type of shoes that some people will never see in their lifetime or, you know, like uh, 
kind of like you get these unicorn type of shoes that you're like, how, like, where do you get these from or whatever? But speaking yeah. of, you know, like unicorns, is has there ever been an unboxing on your show, What's Popping, where you were like, whoa, this is like some next level shoe, like for you? Because obviously you have a different perspective than what you're you yeah. know, showing every single time. I mean, I'm, I'm, to be honest, like I'm still fascinated by stuff just like everybody else. Like I, um, you know, I, I have some access to these brands, but I don't have a full on access where I see everything that's happening. So when they come out with new stuff, I get just as, just as excited as the next per. excuse me. Yeah. I get just as excited as the next person. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of sneakers. I'm a fan of technology. So um, everything that happens with sneakers is exciting to me, just like I think it is like with everybody else, like the new like running shoes, like the Tempo Next Percent or the, you know, or the, the Alpha Fly Next Percent, like Ooh, seeing yeah. the Zoom pods and how cool that looks and then using the Zoom X and seeing how Kipchoge wore the, the, uh, the prototypes of those to beat like the two hour marathon and all that stuff is important to me. And like LeBron having like Air Max and Zoom together, like that stuff still genuinely excites me um, just because I'm, I'm a fan of shoes. I'm a fan of sneakers. So that stuff is, is still exciting to me. So I, when I open a box and I see those things, it's like I go through, I still have the same emotions that I think everyone does when they open them. Totally. So I, I can't say that there was anything in particular that was like, oh, this was super crazy um outside of maybe like the auto adapt stuff but again like everybody experienced that so it's like i i just i just may have seen it a little bit earlier than everyone else mm. but that's i hit i have the same excitement everybody else does totally is there any designers like you know um obviously we i keep on bringing up tinker hatfield you know every now and then because he's you know definitely uh, a staple in the sneaker mm -hmm. culture but you know there's a, a lot of uh you know designers that we don't know of that aren't you know uh as uh politicized or you know in the sneaker culture just known, yeah, yeah. Just known as, as like tinker um i actually just had a conversation um with two designers uh dwayne edwards he runs pencil so basically he was a designer for jordan and he left and they created a school for design wow and so he's basically designing um uh, he's teaching people from all over the world how to design shoes. Um, and Where's then that I happening? Just had a, it's in it's in Portland. Oh wow! Um, okay. Then you have like uh, I just had a conversation with uh, Reggie Wilson. He's at Under Armour. He designed um, Embiid's new signature basketball shoe. So mm -hmm. it was great to talk to like a young a younger designer and his thoughts on design and how he, how he approaches it and all the things that he has to weigh and putting together a design and, you know, putting in a little Easter eggs about, you know, Joel's family and where he's from and things like that. So like it, it's, it's super in, like the design life is super interesting to me. And it's um, those guys like deserve all the praise because they do some amazing work. Totally. Wow. Um, thinking about that, you know, I, I, I want to take us to kind of fast forwarding even to like uh, a bit recently, you designed a shoe with your mom, right? Yes. And for, so for my mom, yeah, yeah, for your mom. So like, as far as like sneaker design, you know, like, have you ever designed a sneaker that are, do you design sneakers like on your own sometimes? Like maybe people don't know you have like a full pamphlet, you know, just <laughs> hidden underneath like something and you just like drawing and, and making, you know, dope shoes. No, no, not yet. Uh, I eventually want to get there um, where I'm designing shoes. Um, I'll probably end up taking one of Dwayne's classes. Um, so I have, so I know exactly what I'm doing, but, uh, no, no, no hidden designs over this way. I'd, I'd love it. I'd love it if I did, but that's just that, that's not my gift. I'll put it, that, I'll put it that way. I hear it. I hear it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was watching, uh, I don't know if you've seen the art of design on Netflix. I haven't seen it. No. Um, well, there's a really, uh, great episode and, uh, as you can tell, I'm a Tinker Hatfield fan, so I'm going to bring this up, but he didn't know really how to design shoes up until like he actually like hurt himself pole vaulting. And so like, mm. you know, and that's when, you know, he, uh, you know, collaborated with, uh, um, oh, what's that guy's name? Not Phil Knight, but, um, uh, is it Bowman? Um, 
uh, coach Bill Bowerman. Yeah, Bill, Bill Bowerman. He uh, collaborates with him, and he didn't even know he had this skill in him. So you might have that skill. You know what I mean? You, uh, I might, yeah. You know, because you get to see a lot of great things, and you know, and, and things like that. But you know, going into now, like where, where do you see you know just the culture moving, and how are you moving within the culture? And I, you know, and when I say culture, I don't mean like I don't like to use that as just like a a direct term as far as uh, you know. Um, like it's just inclusive, but like, what do you see mm -hmm. expansively for yourself and, you know, everything else that's going on? Well, I mean, I see the culture of sneakers continuing to grow. I think that that has um, definitely hit a point in, in, in the popular culture where it's something more people are aware of. Um, Netflix has a show about sneaker heads. Um, you, you, like you saw the stuff on Netflix about the design. Mm -hmm. So I think that the culture of collecting, um, uh, is becoming cooler. Um, uh, shout out to, to the comic book nerds. I think they they paved the way for, for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and now like things like sneakers are starting to get some light. I think it's going to continue to grow. I think the sh like we're heading into a crazy world of technology and we'll start to see how technology is going to affect footwear and the benefits that it can bring. So I think it's I think it's exciting overall. I think the culture has a lot of growing to do, and there's a lot of room for growth, and there there are some great opportunities ahead um, for for the rest of the world to really experience sneakers and the joy that people get around it, from design to performance. Yeah, totally. Can you give us a little bit of insight on just like your tech background and kind of you know uh, you mentioned? I mean, obviously we know about. Um, you know, ear with, uh, you know, kind of these, I mean, ear being the Nike shoe that, uh, was, uh, a derivative of the McFly's right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like technology and shoes and technology in general, like what, um, in what way do you, uh, do you find yourself navigating in that, in that realm? Well, I guess, I guess my larger hope is that, technology enables people to one like make shoes more sustainable so that they're just not ending up in a landfill so some way that shoes can be recycled and i think that kind of comes along with the technology conversation um shoes that can help people stay fit uh i'm a big proponent of staying healthy and exercising so i i think if the more information people can get about their bodies via footwear the better they'll be as far as um, as far as health wise, um, and then like creating custom shoes for people. You know, a lot. You know, every shoe we wear is kind of made for a mass audience. And like, what's what can happen if there are the abilities for people to make shoes that are custom to your foot in particular? Mm. You know, how does that feel? How does that improve how you walk? How does that improve your quality of life? Um, so things like that are where are where I'm looking when it comes to technology. And I think those are really exciting places that that footwear can go. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, yeah, I think, uh, you know, you bring up even, you know, these new this new idea of just like having shoes that are, you know, uh, environmentally friendly. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, researching like recycling, you know, different shoes and um, also like now we see wool on shoes and and, uh, you know, with. Uh, you know, like all birds and some of these other places. Yeah. But I feel like as everybody starts entering the conversation, there's uh, a unique ability to create something from, you know, uh, create something that's not just, uh, you know, an aesthetic, but more of something that can actually contribute to the world. So, yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're going to go to my favorite part of the hype hour, which is the hype moment. Give uh -oh. it up. Boom. All right. So, oh, man, there's, a, there's an audience. I yeah, love we, it. We got the claps, <laughs> you know, so pretty much the hype moment is uh, we're going to do uh, give us five, you know, different things you've been doing during this COVID time that uh, has really just allowed you to have, you know, I mean, you always have freedom, but just allow you to, you know, be inspired and, and stay on your feet. Uh, I think one, uh, ex exercising, um, it's given me a lot of time to kind of exercise and focus on that. So that's been great. Um, two, spending time with family. That's really been awesome. Um, being able to really spend time with them, even though it, it's, it was a little weird at first being around everybody all the time, <laughs> but now you kind of, you kind of embrace it and get into it. 
Um, three, I think it's allowed me to work on my craft a little bit, like focusing on like creating content and finding new ways to create content. Um, the, it's also forced me to kind of rethink the way that I do certain things, the way, way that I work um, and not become reliant on one certain thing. So that's really been helpful um, to kind of force me to change. Um, it's, it forced me to change, but that change I think is working out for the better. Um, and, and then I think really just kind of taking time off and not doing anything and just enjoying the moment. Mm, wow. That's, that's a great one. I think a lot of people, um, you know, you're kind of forced into enjoying the moment, but not you, but I'm saying like some people that are just workaholics, it's just like, well, I don't know what to do because, you know, like, you know, and it's interesting how some people are just, they talk about their job, but now it's been so long, at least, you know, this last like six months has felt like, you know, two years or something, you know, and I mean, you know, in, in retrospect, but, um, that's great, man, to hear that, uh, where, where can we find you? What's new? Um, can you give us any websites or anything like that? We can, you know, get in contact with you and. Um, if anybody wants to follow me, they can follow me at, at Cousteau. That's on like every social media platform, which is K U S T O O. Um, I'm from Twitter to Instagram to Snapchat to I don't know Google Plus or whatever. If that's still around, <laughs> YouTube, uh, everything's Cousteau. So K U S T O O. Um, even on even on Spotify and Bandcamp, you can find some music if Whoa. you if you really, intro, if you really okay. want to dig deep. Let's go. I'm, I'm going to do that actually after this. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to dig deep, there's a, there's a rap album there, but that, that's, that's everything. Wow, man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, man. It's always great talking sure. to you and, and getting with you, man. So, um, yeah, man, that's the hype hour. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Definitely appreciate it. This was a lot, a lot of fun, a lot of great conversation.